Our second speaker uh, today in the engineering track is Fredrik Lindgren. Fredrik has been at CRISP for 13 years and likes to take contracts as a senior software developer and architecture coach. Fredrik has worked for King. All of you probably know about game like Candy Crush uh, and Soda, I think the other one was called. Uh, he's been a Travelink, SBAB, Trustly, and uh, since a while back, he's working closely with me uh, at the Warner Brothers Discovery, uh, endless, countless, at least hours of pair programming in the last uh, few months. Uh, Frederick likes fine dining, uh, restaurants, and board games. If you know about Robo Rally, Frederick is pretty good at that. Uh, I definitely uh, got bested at that last time. Please welcome Frederick Lindgren. Thank you, Max. So yeah, so quite a bit of this talk is going to be quite familiar to you, uh, since it's uh, telling a bit of a story of what we've been up to for the past uh, year. So, um, so, so the title is uh, Service Evolution Under Pressure. And uh, it's about the, the work to <clears throat> merge two streaming services. Uh, and how we've been using patterns and deliberate trade-offs to reduce the risk doing that. So a little bit of uh, business context. Um, so uh, I and, and Max, we've been working with uh, Discovery for um, uh, a few years. So the, it's uh, working with the Discovery Plus streaming service and um, oh, so the Discovery Plus service has uh, a bit more than 20 million subscribers uh, all over the world uh, or, or across the world. Uh, it's available in US, in Europe and in India. And recently, well, fairly recently, we've been merged uh, with the uh, with Wonder Bros, and more specifically in terms of uh, streaming services, we've been working with uh, the HBO Max uh, service coming from that side. Uh, it's a somewhat larger uh, user base, um, some 75 plus million subscribers across HBO and HBO Max. Uh, that's uh, public figures from a couple a year ago or a little bit more. And uh, it's available uh, in US, Latin America, and Europe, maybe some other places as well. So that's kind of the the services. Um, the um, context of our work is a microservice called the CMS service. So I'm not going to uh, try to uh, explain the whole merger, but uh, it's a focus on uh, what we have been doing and how we've been handling it for, for our particular service. So the CMS service has a responsibility of providing the, um, well, it's a, a, an admin API for configuring the, the site, and it serves the the browsing experience when you go to the streaming site. So that's uh, when you uh, browse the different shows or series, uh, you find what's available. But once you actually start to watch it, uh, it goes to completely different parts of the system. So we're, well, we're focusing on um, providing the available content and, and serving that API. To do that, this service integrates with a lot of other services. So a key thing for it is being kind of a backend for frontend, but not necessarily just that. So we integrate with a service, a content service that has the service catalog, the, the, the movie and series catalog. We connect with user profiles. We gather the uh, viewing history for a user, get favorites. We integrate with personalized recommendations, with search, and several other services. And we integrate these services over 
uh, gRPC and uh, for some information also over Kafka. And this whole thing is deployed in in the cloud in in Amazon uh, AWS, and it's a, a Kubernetes deployed service. So it's uh, packaged as a Dockerized container. Uh, it's deployed and horizontally scalable with uh, dynamic auto scaling, and we depend on AWS infrastructure for uh storage resources etc so so that's kind of the the context of our service um important for the work uh, and for how to approach this merger is uh, the key architecture characteristics for the service so um so basically one of the most important things for the CMS service with serving that public API that everyone comes in to, uh, to select what to watch is that it has a high availability. So basically it needs to be uh, up 24-7 uh, uh, all year round. And we're pretty good at it. So uh, I, I checked some numbers uh, when creating the presentation and at least for the... Uh, well, past week or past month, we have a five nine uh, percentage uptime. So basically, uh, very few uh, requests fail, and, and that's also the uh, architecture characteristic that we definitely care most about in the team. It should not fail. It should not fall over. Uh, another important thing. Uh, since we're serving a publicly accessible service with a pretty high public profile is that it's reasonably snappy to use it. So low latency is also an important factor for uh, the service. And typically, well, most requests uh, uh, get dealt with within uh, 100 milliseconds. So that's well, nine out of 10. Um, the other thing, well, the third thing is um, performance and scalability. So we have millions of uh, viewers around the world. Not all of them are in browsing at the same time, but um, looking at um, some data uh, over a time period, uh, we've had between 2,500 and 7,000 requests per second uh, across our deployments for Discovery Plus. So that's kind of the, roughly the size of the traffic we need to deal with. And the fourth and also important thing is this service needs to be configurable. So uh, depending on the brand and market where it's used, uh, so Discovery as, well, we're serving Discovery Plus, but we're also uh, have been serving Eurosport and, and some other brands. These different brands have different features available and it's also different across markets. So configurability is also an important uh, characteristic for the CMS service. So that's kind of um, the context for, for our uh, challenge. Right, so... Um, well, branching is easy, merging is hard, and now the, the task at hand was merging two very large organizations. So it's combining teams across time zones. Um, the uh, Warner Bros. HBO uh, organization has a lot of development teams in, in the US, in Seattle. They have some in Europe, in Hungary. Uh, our team is in Stockholm. There are other discovery teams in in the US, there are teams in India. So that's one challenge, uh, who should do what. Um, I'm not gonna go into much of that in this talk, but it's it's kind of a, uh, well, it takes um, time and effort as well. Also, when doing this merger, uh, when we first heard of it, we, we thought that, yeah, maybe they will just take the, uh, the content from one of the services and, fit it into the platform of the other. But 
uh, based on uh, architecture due diligence and research. Um, somewhere in the organization, it was decided that a new thing should be launched on a new tech platform. So we're not doing it on the HPU platform or purely on the discovery platform, but building a new platform and a kind of pull the best of both in terms of services and components from the two different organizations. And in terms of product, it was decided that the first thing to launch is a, a, a merged product. Um, so, and it's uh, basically HBO Max and Discovery Plus uh, merged into the new Max streaming service, which has launched in the US. And it was launched in the end of May. And also during this period, it was decided that while we're building the new thing and launching that, we're actually going to keep the existing Discovery Plus service up and running. So this is a little bit of a tough thing to to do. And just to put a little bit more pressure on it, about this time of year, last year, or well, maybe a few weeks earlier, um, there was a public announcement in a, I think it was a, one of these um, earnings uh, meetings. Uh, it, it was announced that the new service will launch next summer, so this, this summer, and that was announced in, in August. So, so what does that mean for our team and um, and the challenge to, uh, well, sitting there in August, new organizations, and knowing that uh, we should have something launched together with all the other teams by summer. So for the CMS service, the scope for Max was, we need a, uh, should have a new code repository, a new build and deployment setup. We need to deploy um, uh, in a multi-region deployment. There's a new request context architecture. I'll get to that later. And some of our integrations in the system will be replaced and some of the APIs will be modified. Well, so how do we about it? How do we decide how to approach it from an architecture point of view? Well, one of the key trade-offs that we needed to, to discuss and decide on is, do we do this as small incremental steps or do we do a kind of bigger bang replacement? And some of the pros and cons are here. So with small incremental steps, the code base is more complicated. It's harder to understand. There's potentially more work, but the benefit is that you can get early feedback and the risk is much lower. While a single step replacement, you know what the code looks like before and after, it's, you don't have the mix. But a big bang release for a very visible public service uh, with limited feedback is a much higher risk. And within the team and, and the organization, we, we opted for minimizing the risk. So we'll try to do this with as small incremental steps as possible. The next thing to do or decide, so, so basically we were, um, there was a mandate with a new tech platform that we should move uh, the code for the, for the Mac service to a new uh, repository, even a new GitHub organization that that's part of joining these two organizations. We were not moving one of them into the other, we're setting up a new one. So then there was a discussion, should we fork our current code to a separate uh, repository or should we maintain a single repository driving both the uh, Discovery Plus deployment and the, the new uh, platform? And at first it can look quite straightforward to, to fork. There is uh, no risk that we break this existing production with the changes. We can remove unused features. It can be kind of a, a new slate, which sometimes looks um, 
uh, nice to use and it's quicker and less complicated. But on the other hand, <clears throat> uh, the main functionality between the CMS service in one platform and the other is basically the same. And by keeping the same repository and building from that, we would get uh, continuous production verification from the deployments to the existing system. And in terms of long-term maintenance, we were afraid that if we split it, eventually the code bases would diverge. And then when we uh, needed to do important fixes, it would not be compatible. And we were also afraid that uh, if all the work is going on in in a new uh, in, for the new stuff, uh, the knowledge of how the old system uh, works would eventually uh, be reduced. And in the end, uh, the decision found that, okay, we're going to contain using a single repository and we can always fork later if the um, uh, if that proves to be necessary. So that's two uh, significant decisions. So trying to make it in small steps and keeping the single code repository. That has a, with that follows a, a requirement on the system. So now we need to make the CMS service portable between the two different uh, tech platforms. And, um, and and when it comes to the patterns part of this talk, this is where I'm going to focus. So the key to making the service portable is uh, by abstracting and encapsulating dependencies. So I have them at three different levels. So to start with, um, since both platforms are based on deploying Dockerized uh, containers in Kubernetes. Uh, I mean, they're they're very similar. So, so from that perspective, the Docker's and Kubernetes abstraction uh, pays in our advantage. So basically, the, uh, uh, the environment dependencies between the different platforms is abstracted at a very clear boundary that we can use. So that's um, a boundary that we uh, depend on for the different deployment pipelines, but also for the environment configuration in the two different platforms. The next level is the use of ports and adapters pattern uh, within, <clears throat> within the service when it comes to integrating with external system dependencies. So we use that uh, both for the internal CMS persistence, which I'll come in, uh, get into in more details in a minute, and for all the integrations to other services. And the third level is encapsulating code dependencies within the system using a, an anti-corruption layer. Uh, so basically uh, where we depend on external models, uh, or information, we want to wrap that inside the CMS so that we can speak our own typed language and not uh, be at the mercy of changes from external systems. Okay, so the nice thing with these is that, well, the CMS code already applies several of these patterns, and we've introduced that for the sake of testability. Um, and the nice side effect is that uh, may, it makes the portability of the CMS service feasible. So the first challenge we had was we want to build and deploy the same binary to both Max and Discovery Plus. So in this case, when we have a pretty standard, well, at least at the conceptual level, uh, build pipeline. So there's a step to build, compile, and unit test the code. It then be uh, is packaged and we create a Docker image, which is the same binary image for both deployments that is pushed to registry. And this is after this step is where we do kind of parallel uh, deployment pipelines. So there's a step in, in both pipelines where we do 
end-to-end -end testing together with other uh, connected services. And a last step in both pipelines where it's deployed. So here we're benefiting from the uh, abstraction of uh, Docker container images and Kubernetes um, so that, uh, well, basically it's different systems, but it's the same thing that we can deploy. The next challenge uh, was and is much uh, tougher and, and bigger, but we've addressed it as well. So in the new platform and, and for the new Max deployment, um, there's a requirement that the deployment is uh, multi-regional in, in AWS cloud terms. Uh, so for discovery, we have this quite practical, but um, um, situation that the European deployment or Euro uh, Discovery Plus Europe is separate from Discovery Plus US and Canada. So they're kind of uh, fully individually deployed and, and we don't have the multi-regional uh, challenge. But for the new Max deployment, we actually want uh, a multi-regional and, and eventually global uh, deployment where administrators can go in to one place and manage this service uh, uh, across regions. So while in the discovery situation, we have a We've been relying on a uh, AWS RDS Postgres um, kind of deployed locally in, in the region. Uh, but for Max, after some investigation, we realized that the best way to replicate the, the data was to use uh, AWS DynamoDB global tables, which has built-in replication across regions, and then build out a an AWS Lambda function uh, connected to the um, replication stream and, and do uh, regional cache invalidation. So how do we uh, make that happen without disrupting all the logic in the service? Well, so before going into the details of the solution, well, we can have a look at what the CMS persistence does, and I should have a little view on my timing as well. Well, so the admin, well, so the um, resistance uh, has basic CRUD through the admin API. Uh, this is stored as JSON. And for the public API, we're only serving the latest revision. So in admin, you can have history, but we're serving just the latest. So, so we split read and write in the model. Uh, I see I need to speed up a little bit. So we're using uh, course and adapters pattern. So basically, um, as Alexander in the previous talk also explained, um, th there's a clean application level thing with business logic. That application defines the boundary to, to the outside using ports. And then there are adapters that translates between the application and external technology details. In practice, for the CMS, that means that we have a well ports defined from the business logic point of view. We have a public content store which is uh, serving the the public API reads and admin content store for the uh, administration rights and. In the existing discovery, we had a Postgres implementation of these. And now we had to add a DynamoDB uh, adapter. And the, nice, uh, and the nice thing is the choice of which adapter is instantiated is, is done on startup, but the service logic and, and, and all the business logic is totally independent of this. So the next challenge that I'm going to dig into a little bit is um, an architectural change where one of the key dependencies across all the request flows uh, needed to change. So 
so information about the user and, and the request context was previously fetched from a service, and now it's coming from a header in the request, which is really nice from an architectural point of view, but we needed to uh, handle it in the uh, uh, in in the migration. So, um, so the challenge we have here is that we had a an existing corrupting object, which is the request context. It was coming from a shared library. Um, it was used and passed throughout the service code. It was full of properties that were used by a lot of different services, but only some of them were used by the CMS. So what we've done there is that we've added a, an anti-corruption layer in, in, in the way of a wrapper object, which implements just the interface that we need in the CMS logic. So we, con we now control the API towards that, and we replace the usage of the old object with our new abstraction. And to be able to migrate step by step, we still had the possibility to, to open it up Let's see. Uh, and, and get access to the old one. So how can we make that portable? Well, to, to support a new context that was needed to be added, we added one more pass-through property, and otherwise we just mapped the new context to the internal CMS request context uh, interface. Uh, and the nice thing then is that the service logic itself only depends on the um, anti-corruption layer, and we can co-deploy uh, or deploy in, in both platforms uh, with just this uh, translation layer. Let's see, Max, how am I doing on time? You have one minute officially. Okay. I'll try to speed up. Sorry for... Right. Um, so... You have Slack uh, showing now. Oops, sorry. Okay. So, um, briefly through the last couple of things that we needed to handle. Uh, for all the other integrations with services, we also uh, we already had ports and adapters patterns. So it's easy to, depending on deployment, use one or the other. And now to the wrap up, sorry for rushing the end. So um, important um, when doing architectural trade-offs, deciding whether to go with one way or the other. Always look at your key architectural characteristics. So for us, it was minimizing risk um, and keeping uh, latency and uh, availability up. Um, the patterns that I uh, presented, they were already in the CMS, uh, mainly to improve testability. And testability is usually a good indicator of decoupling that makes an application evolvable. And lastly, we still needed to develop all the new functionality for the Mac service. The benefit from these patterns was that we were able to do it incrementally uh, to reduce the risk instead of doing it all and, and having a big bang deployment and, and launch uh, without really knowing how it would go. So thank you for listening. And again, a little bit sorry for having to rush it at the end. Thank you so much, Frederick. I think we forgive you. You uh, lost a little bit of time in the, the beginning. Um, we do not have time for questions because I want to respect the breaks and the starting point for the next uh, uh, the next slot, but we do have a Q&A at the end of the day. So I hope if Frederick can stay until the yeah. end of the day, that uh, you all will be able to join then and perhaps ask some questions. Again, yes, thank you so stay. much. Uh, take your 10 minute break and uh, I hope to see you all in one of the other slots in 10 minutes.
All right. Goodbye.